All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I think we're going to get started. I know people will probably be trickling in for the next few minutes. Um, so I'm so happy to see all of you here. And I welcome you to Carlton Fields, to our beautiful new office space here in downtown. I'm sure many of you have not been here before. Um, and I'm glad you decided to attend our program, which is focused on building resiliency into the South Florida construction community. In an ever-changing world, the importance of our buildings and our critical infrastructure being able to withstand various challenges cannot be overstated, especially in this community. Over the next two hours, we will explore the economic and the strategic benefits of a dedicated investment in resilience and public infrastructure, site planning, building design, and construction techniques, and how policy-driven resilience initiatives and incentives in the insurance marketplace are now paving the way for resilient development in South Florida. This means not only recognizing those assets in our community that we need to focus as being the most vulnerable and that we need to harden and put together strategies so they can withstand the next major storm event as we're sitting here today heading into the peak of hurricane season or the ongoing coastal flooding and red tides but also when we're moving into new construction and how we're implementing resilience initiatives and resilient components into our projects. Our goal today is to foster a deeper understanding of resilience in construction, share best practices, and inspire collaborative efforts from both the public and the private sectors, including all of you stakeholders who are in this room today who care about this issue. Now, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce you to our wonderful panel who have graciously volunteered their time today to speak to everyone. First up, I have Jeremy Miller from Gallagher. Gallagher is one of the leading insurance risk management firms with more than 100 offices globally, and their construction practice serves more than 31,000 construction clients all over the world. Now, Probably one of the reasons many of you are here today is that it's no secret that the, we are facing an insurability crisis in the state of Florida and that the insurance industry has essentially blacklisted Florida as being a high risk market. And, and I'll tell you, our real estate and our construction clients are very concerned about this issue with increasing premiums and deductibles, the fact that so many insurance companies are now refusing to even issue wrap policies for any new construction projects in the state, if they're insuring here at all. But I'll tell you, it's not all doom and gloom. Jeremy Miller is here to tell us about a possible solution to the insurance crisis we are facing and how resilient design and construction can not only lead to lower insurance premium, but better access to coverage and a lot more competition in the insurance marketplace. Jeremy is a senior vice president with Gallagher for the entire state of Florida. And among his many licenses and um, credentials, Jeremy has a construction risk and insurance specialist designation that enables him to provide specialized expertise to his clients in the area of construction. In his career, he has developed specializations in the industry of real estate, development, nonprofit, construction, and healthcare. To his right is Amy Knowles. Amy is the Chief Resilience Officer and the Director of Environment and Sustainability for the City of Miami Beach. Now, I'm sure many of you probably heard Amy speak. She speaks at a lot of events because she really is the resilience leadership for the city and, and for this community, quite honestly. And she works closely not only with city officials, but local municipalities all over South Florida. And, and the world, quite frankly, she's traveled and talked about resilience strategies in the Netherlands, um, where else, Chile, across the United States. She is a really is a thought leader and on the forefront of this issue. Um, Amy focuses on integrating climate preparedness planning with nature-based solutions and infrastructure. She has so many amazing slides and case studies to share with you, not only of past projects that they've implemented in the city, but their future, the future things that they're planning to do in terms of infrastructure and new development. In planning for sea level rise, she recently helped secure a $48 million resilience funding for projects, running from dune restoration to infrastructure. 
She has led the city's first vulnerability assessment and the business case analysis of the stormwater program, both highlighting the social and economic importance of protecting Miami Beach. And she also recently launched the Fight the Flood program, a private property adaptation program to incentivize private property investments in resilience. And I will tell you, this is a really interesting program. Amy was telling me about it. It's a grant matching program. So not only residential homeowners that live on the beach, but also um, owners of commercial properties as well can benefit by hardening their existing assets and having a, uh, the monies matched by the city to actually incentivize people to do that. Now, I, I don't know if a lot of people know about it. They've been doing a lot of outreach and communicating that program, but it's beyond just new construction. It's happening to look at the existing assets that we have and what South Florida's built community is gonna look like in the future. She serves on the North American Steering Committee for the Global Resilient Cities Network and participates in the work of the Southeast Florida Climate Change Compact and Resiliency Florida. Um, Amy also, like I mentioned before, really believes in collaboration, is critical for resilience and works in partnerships with Miami-Dade County, the city, the Miami Foundation to implement Resilient 305, which is a shared resiliency strategy across all of South Florida. Um, honestly, we are very fortunate to have Amy here with us today. And she's gonna be discussing all of the resilience issues she's, ha she's started and the local codes and ordinances and infrastructure investments focused on improving resiliency in Miami Beach. Now to her right is Maria Hernandez. Maria is currently serving as the geo bond program director for the city, where she is leading the implementation of a $439 million taxpayer funded program with 57 separate master projects and numerous sub projects, many of which are all focused and geared towards resiliency. In addition to her responsibilities as the geo bond for the geo bond program, Maria is also the liaison to the city for development and construction of the new convention center hotel that's going to be connected to the convention center that we recently finished renovating. Uh, prior to that, Maria was responsible for coordinating all the capital improvement projects for the city. And in 2014, she was appointed by the city manager to be the director of the convention center district. And she is the, the person, and I, and I dealt with Maria on a daily basis for many years, uh, <laughs> overseeing the 25-acre, $640 million convention center renovation and expansion project, which is the largest capital project in the city's history that was recently completed in April, 2020. And Maria is, has wonderful pictures and she's gonna be able to show you all of the different resilience measures that the city of Miami Beach was thinking about, about back in 2014, before this issue was really in the forefront of any of our minds, that anyone was really talking about it. And the things that they did um, by increasing the elevation, moving trees, um, the different, raising all of the, or the HVAC and the electrical systems. So there'll be constant continuity in the event we have some major storm event. Um, in addition to all the new projects that she's working on through the geo bond program. And when Maria, before Maria came to the city, she came from the private sector where she worked for over 20 years, uh, handling as a, working on architecture firms and real estate development, she is a Florida architect and a lead accredited professional. And last but not least, all the way to my left is my partner, Mike Rooney. Mike and I are both partners here in Miami, specializing in the area of construction law. And just a little bit about our firm, since we haven't introduced ourselves, Carlton Fields has approximately 330 attorneys and government and financial consultants across the country from Los, An Los Angeles to New York to DC to all over the state of Florida. And our particular construction practice group, we features one of the largest and most substantively comprehensive construction groups in Florida. Uh, Carlton Fields earned the national first tier ranking in the US News World and Report for Best Lawyers uh, are for the 20th consecutive year in 2022, 
Chambers USA ranked our firm's construction practice group number one in Florida. And, and I'll tell you, Mike and I, we represent all types of any construction stakeholders from owners, developers, contractors, signers, public, private owners, municipalities, um, on all facets of projects. And we're really happy that you guys have joined us today. And with that, I'm gonna turn over to Mike. He's gonna give you a few pointers and just briefly go over the topic in general before we get uh, going with Jeremy to talk about insurance. Great, thank you so much, Heather. And, and I wanna say thank you to everyone for being here today. We really appreciate you taking your time this afternoon to be with, with us. And, and hopefully the, the presentations today will be a little interesting, maybe a little bit different take than what you're used to. Uh, Jeremy's really going to go into kind of the nuts and bolts of procurement of insurance. So not so much coverage, but but how this insurance is really underwritten, how you get project-specific insurance, and, and how resiliency and changes in the marketplace are affecting the ability to procure that insurance. And, and we're it's great to have with us uh, the representatives from the city of Miami Beach today who are actually implementing and have implemented resilience programs on the beach. So this is not conceptual, this is what has actually been done. You'll be able to understand the benefit in a direct way uh, rather than the hypothetical. But to give a little bit of an introduction, um, assuming my clicker works, there we go. Uh, you know, when we talk about resilience, to me it's, it, it's a term that's come into use kind of in the last you know 10 years or so, but really Florida has always been at the forefront of resilience. You know, when I first came to Florida in, in 1995, it was just after Hurricane Andrew in 1992, which, you know, those of you that were here may recall was a Category 5 hurricane that quite frankly leveled huge parts uh, of the South Florida community. And in that South Florida building code that was adopted two years after Andrew was a direct response to that natural event, to that disaster, making material changes to how we would construct structures going forward, changing the way we'd strap the roofs to buildings, requiring impact resistant windows that we all take for granted today, requiring shutters, you know, even the old school shutters were better than no shutters, right? <clears throat> so I, I think the, the concept of resilience, you know, in terms of terminology, has kind of developed a more modern parlance for uh, a lack of a better word, how to uh, plan for, withstand, overcome and adapt to adverse events. That's, that's from the AIA, the American Institute of Architects. I think it's a good definition. And, and they broadly define adverse events as acute and chronic threats posed by natural and human caused hazards, climate change, degradation of natural resources and population growth. So basically anything in the environment that ultimately affects your community, you know, acute events, basically short-term hurricane. That's what we think of in South Florida, but you know, it can be uh, tornadoes in the Midwest. It can be, I don't know why they're called different tsunamis in, in the rest of the world. Uh, another, the Urban Lands Institute, probably you all are familiar with that. That's an organization that promotes development. They develop what they call the 10 principles for resilience. And you're going to see that a number of the concepts they talk about, you know, our speakers today are going to talk about in terms of implementing resilience programs. One of, one of the things that is important for developing these programs is Understanding vulnerabilities, you know, understanding how these events affect and increase the risk to a particular building or particular community's infrastructure and being able to articulate that to the public, right? What is the benefit of resilience? How does it affect you and how does it impact you? But at the end of the day, in addition to the, for lack of a better word, the building or infrastructure changes, these are community issues, right? So conceptually, the concept is if you have a more resilient community, it is better able to rebound and impact when you do have an acute event. Uh, promotes equity. So the, the concept is if, if you're not going to have a buy-in in the entire community, you know, making one portion of the community resilient is simply not feasible. There needs to be a distribution of the resiliency, the infrastructure, and the benefit to the community as a whole. That includes things like leveraging community assets, identifying what it is that the community needs to be able to recover when you have a storm event, particularly in coastal communities, we're dealing with storm surge, windstorm damage, loss of electricity. Ultimately, resiliency redefines how and where we're going to build things. You know, you think about it in terms of the, 
the hard how, you know, do we have stronger buildings? How do we build? What elevation do we build at? Where do we build these things? I think both in the, the public sector and the private sector, look, there has to be a business case when you talk about resiliency. By adding this component or this feature to a building or a project, what is the long-term financial benefit for that project? And I'll give you a concrete example after this before I turn it over to the speakers. Uh, accurately price the cost of inaction. <clears throat> I, mean, I mean, when we talk about Hurricane Andrew, that was a long time ago, but $27 billion in 1992 in terms of damage equates roughly to $100, $100 billion today. All of that you know, could have been avoided had we had different resilient building codes in place at that time. Design with natural systems. This is a concept that the Urban Land Institute promotes that I think is important. You know, a lot of times in communities, building and zoning is artificial. You know, it's an industrial area, it's a residential area, it's a this area, but it doesn't look at the underlying geography of the area. You know, how does the underlying natural geography impact the ability of construction in that area to withstand the elements, to withstand a potential windstorm event, to withstand a potential rise in sea level? You know, maximizing co-benefits is simply a way of saying, look, you know, <clears throat> by figuring out how infrastructure works with these projects, overall, that's going to enhance the quality of life. You know, what is the benefit of these projects? And you'll see in the concrete examples from the city, you know, it's not just you, you build something to deal with water mitigation, but it's integrated into a park. It's integrated into a green space. It's integrated into beautifying an existing area, you know, taking away asphalt replacing it with green space that also serves the dual purpose of resiliency. And then last, I mean, I think this is for everyone in construction, always important, innovation and technology. <clears throat> Everything changes. When I started practicing law, you know, I'd meet with clients to talk about a construction project. We'd bring in these boxes full of plans and roles, right? And it would take 15 people to carry them in and we'd flip through these sheets. Now you go to a job site to die, everyone has an iPad. You know, they have a 3D model of the building. They can pull up a plan sheet on an iPad. They can, you know, roll on it, it enhances everything. I won't tell you I understand BIM modeling, but it's there. You know, these, these types of innovation and technology allow for more efficient construction. I think it will allow ultimately for integration of many of the resilient type ideas into buildings at a cost that will ultimately be less because of the development of technology. So a classic business case that's often cited is the 1450 <clears throat> Brickle uh, building, which was a large office tower, class A building. That was Miami's first LEEDS gold certified building. It was completed in 2010. It had a number of resilient features that weren't common at the time. You know, one of the kind of dramatic features of the building is it was actually designed for, in South Florida, we call it large missile impact. And so basically there's two types of missile impact, small missile and large missile. Under the code, up to 30 feet, you only have to have large missile impacts. So that's theoretically that larger debris is not going to get higher. They built it all the way up, large missile impact. So think about that. A, a theoretically, that building would withstand hurricane force winds of up to 300 miles per hour. At the time when it was constructed, it was the, the strongest curtain wall system in the entire United States. So, you know, what are some of the other features of resilience they built into it? And, and we're going to talk a lot about this largely because, look, we're a coastal community, right? So one of the things is ground floor elevation. So this is one of the first buildings where they really consciously elected to raise the ground floor elevation as high as they possibly could in a commercially feasible manner to avoid theoretical storm flood, right? They anticipated, you know, power outages. The entire building has an appropriate generator backup system. They have the windstorm protection far greater than other projects. Uh, at the end of the day, these investments cost approximately $15 million, but the business case was, what are the returns? Over a million dollars annually in electricity, mainly because of the gold lead certification, insurance savings, competitive insurance, different rates, better coverage. And, and that's really one of the things we're going to talk about today in some detail. But faster lease up, the usual marketing for all those in the, you in the development sector, look, you, you have kind of the novel, new, perfect project. And, and I think it sells. So let's talk a little bit about insurance. I think we all are familiar. There's been 
numerous articles in the New York Times talking about commercial carriers pulling out of technology <clears throat> markets. Uh, a lot of that's in the home building sector, but the reality is it's affecting the commercial market as well. You know, an example of this flood insurance. In many places like the United States, there are regions where you cannot get flood insurance in the private market. You have FEMA here, government insurance of last resort. You know, I think whenever we talk about resilience, I talk a little bit about climate change. And obviously that's somewhat of a charged topic. You know, it's kind of like talking a little about, about religion or, you know, who's your favorite politician, right? But, but I think the thing to, to keep in mind is, you know, whether you perceive it to be, you know, caused by human cause or not, that's really immaterial. The reality is now there is real market impact where carriers and others look at regions like South Florida and say, hey, climate change is affecting the outcome of our risk and we're not going to write insurance or we're not going to do this. And it affects how much money you pay and how you develop your projects. So fundamentally, what is insurance? Insurance is risk mitigation. There's nothing we can build without risk mitigation. So if you cannot get insurance products <clears throat> to mitigate the risk of your product, you're not going to be able to build and develop. So it is critical that we understand how adding resilience to projects or to regions has a long-term benefit. I mean, it's a cumulative effect. So you'll see there's, you know, series of projects, for example, ongoing in the city of Miami Beach that over time, they're having a long-term effect on the insurability of that region, on the perceived credit worthiness of the city itself because of the infrastructure development. So I think with resiliency, you have to think about it long-term. This is a long-term process. Changes to development practices, you know, changes to investing in the resilient infrastructure. Ultimately, there's going to be reforms to the building code. So I think all of us would think this is a temporary thing or it's not going to affect our projects. Ultimately, it's going to be a requirement. Uh, so it, I think it's important that we get ahead of the curve on that and, and price that into our projects and figure out how best to use that. And lastly, there'll be changes to land planning and others. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it over uh, to Jeremy Miller, who's going to talk about kind of honestly the nuts and bolts of how insurance really works and help you understand its impact in the market. So Jeremy, let me turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, big thanks to Carlton Fields for having me today. Uh, it's been great working with uh, with Heather and Mike, outstanding attorneys, and Carlton Fields is, does truly exceptional work in this space, as many of you know. So um, secondly, before we get started, I just want to give a warning to everyone. If your heart rate spikes, if your adrenaline starts to build a little bit, it's all normal. Don't be alarmed. This is insurance. It gets a lot of people excited. <laughs> I recognize that. So just be prepared. Um no, it's tough to get a crowd to talk about this topic. Uh, this is a, a necessary evil uh, sea in which I swim every day, so it's difficult, but it's also very, very important. It hasn't been this important or this distressed uh, in decades. So um, a lot of things that, that hopefully you'll take away today are some take and use concepts that you can take back to your respective firms or to your clients and hopefully improve the overall process at the, at the end of the day. Um, so I'm going to try and make this very dry topic as exciting as I possibly can which is a, a long reach. I recognize that, but we're going to try and have some fun with it. So here we go. Um, so an overview of what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about four key topics today. Uh, I'm going to give you an update on the state of the insurance market, um, which I know sounds exciting, but uh, there's a lot of movement and it's been more dynamic in the last 12 months than what we've ever seen in the history of insurance, which dates back 300 years to London. Um, we're going to talk about catastrophe modeling as well. Um, the importance and the reliance in the insurance industry on catastrophe modeling and how you can take more control of that process to produce better results for you. Um, thirdly, the underwriting process and key variables that make an impact. And then lastly, resiliency process and the overwhelming impact that resiliency, especially in today's market, can have on the results of, of your property insurance program. So first of all, reinsurance, which I'm sure many of you know what reinsurance is, but reinsurance is a product for insurance companies to purchase their own insurance. So they are hedging their bets off their books of business, protecting, hedging their balance sheet for catastrophic losses. And so the reinsurance market um, is, is represented and dominated by a very small few um, compared to the primary insurance market. The primary insurance market has thousands and thousands of players. 
The reinsurance market is global in scope, um, and they are providing the financial backstop for the insurance companies. And so when we look at the state of the insurance market, it begins with reinsurance. It begins with the reinsurers. They sit at the very top and they set the pricing and everything else flows down to the primary insurance companies, to the policyholders, and eventually the consumer at the end of the day. Reinsurance starting January 1st of this year, I can, I can tell you a story. Historically, the reinsurance renewals for the, the upcoming year has been completed around mid-October. Those insurance uh, treaties are completed. The primary insurance companies then have the opportunity to go and price their products, determine their cost of capital, start issuing their policies and preparing for the January 1st renewals when those reinsurance treaties actually take effect. This past year, they weren't completed predominantly until December 29th. That's how difficult last year's catastrophe losses were to the reinsurance market. They continued to fester throughout third and fourth quarter, um, and they came from areas that, that that we never expected. I mean, everybody remembers the, the winter freeze in Texas. Whoever would have thought that that would be such a disruptive event in the United States? You look at the wildfires, you look at the flooding, um, you look at the hailstorms. All of these things are extremely difficult for the insurance companies to model and predict as opposed to name storms. Um, so that began the fourth quarter of last year. The reinsurance renewals were finalized, put to bed. The next week, we're working with our team at Gallagher Re. They're giving us reports on the results. And it was the most catastrophic renewal in the history of insurance. Um, we have, I can give you an example. I have a, a property underwriter that I work closely with who writes a lot of property throughout Florida, including South Florida. And let's just say to pick a round number, his book of business was a billion dollars of insured values. His book of business, December 31st, 2022, had one billion dollars in values reflected. Starting January 1st of 2023, he only had the ability to underwrite six hundred million dollars in values. That was the impact of the reinsurance. On top of that, his cost of capital increased by two and a half to three times. This is a catastrophic underwriter who writes a lot of coastal, a lot of high valued um, properties and everything changed. So now that underwriter has to look at his book of business and say, I have to reduce this by 40%. I have to increase premiums by two or three times. And our chief underwriting officer is going to enforce us to add new exclusions to the policy, narrow the coverage, increase deductibles. And that's when the storm began uh, this year. The next reinsurance renewal was April 1st, and it was worse than January 1st. The next one was July 1st, and it was worse than April 1st. And so that trend is continuing to deepen itself. And so that's the problem in the insurance market. So all the primary insurance companies that most of you deal with, they're now passing that directly down to you all because they've had to recalculate how they're going to underwrite the, the, the capacity. Um, we're also seeing a lack of new capital. Usually the leading indicator in the, in the insurance market when we're in a difficult market, the first step of improving the market is we see new capital coming into the market. So you think about capital that's on the sideline, they're looking at the Florida property market saying rates are at the highest level they've ever been. Deductibles are the highest level they've ever been. You've added these exclusionary wording into the policies to narrow the coverage to give the insurance company the advantage. Why not invest our deploy our capital in the state of Florida to write property insurance so we can capitalize on huge profitability? We have seen zero capital come into the market so far. That's what we're waiting on. That's for the first sign of relief that we're hoping is going to attract more capital to the state of Florida so that more competition can, can breed and those forms start to improve and the pricing starts to improve as well. On top of the rate increases, on, on top of the capacity issues, most of our property uh, clients right now with larger portfolios, we're not going to one or two insurance companies anymore. We are going to anywhere from seven to 50 insurance companies to add the layers in to be able to arrive at the total insured value that we need. The catastrophic trends have just dominated the market. I mentioned that earlier, the storm, the winter storm in Texas, all the wildfires that we're seeing. I mean, whoever would have predicted the tragedy in Maui um, to be so devastating as it was. Um, the name storms, everybody's watching Hurricane Lee right now in the Atlantic. All the meteorologists are saying it's going to turn north, but Who's going to give 100% confidence in that, right? So that's that's the issue. That's the concerning factors right now um, is frequency and severity of catastrophic losses continues to escalate every single year. And that's creating major pressure on profitability for the insurance market. Inflation is a major, major concern right now. Um, general inflation throughout the country, obviously, but as it relates to property insurance, as it relates to constructability, we have seen major increases and in spikes in construction costs. Labor and materials are through the roof. 
And insurance companies for years have allowed the policyholder to be able to say, this is the replacement cost valuation on my building. I have an appraiser. He or she came out, conducted the appraisal. We can rebuild this for $125 a foot. The insurance companies are saying, no mas, it's $175 a foot, take it or leave it. So not only are your premiums doubling, tripling, your deductibles going up, but also the value that you're insuring your building for is going up by a significant margin as well. So all of these pressures are adding significant cost pressure to Florida property business right now. Interest rates are also challenging, right? So insurance companies statutorily are required to put a percentage of every premium dollar into a policyholder surplus account. And that's your catastrophic claims payment fund, basically. Furthermore, the statute states that there are only certain ways that you can invest those dollars. You have to invest those dollars in a very safe investment. And so most of those policyholder surplus dollars wind up in bonds. So as interest rates continue to spiral upward and the Federal Reserve continues to, to hint at the fact there might be more increases coming down the pike later this year, that's the question of what's going to happen. What's going to happen to the insurance company's investment income at that point? And then new terms and conditions. We've seen deductibles north of I-4 is kind of the, a line that I, I like for the state of Florida. North of I-4, we used to have deductibles anywhere from 1% to 3% on a name storm basis. Today, 5% is the minimum for north of I-4. Very few exceptions uh, here and there. South of I-4, 5% is absolutely the cost of admission. You're lucky to get that. But we're starting to see the farther south you go, 75 and 10% is becoming much more commonplace in the market. Down in the Keys, we're even seeing 125 to 15%. So that's that's where it's kind of stabilized right now. We don't think it's going to continue to increase at this point, but if the market continues to worsen later in the year, the sky's the limit in my opinion. Yeah, Jeremy, before we move on, can you talk a little bit about the, the concept of windstorm coverage versus storm surge? Because yeah. I think that's important to all of our yes, absolutely. All of our attendees. Great question, Mike. So in a in an improved market prior to 2023, um, our goal was to always get the underwriters to include storm surge in the definition of wind. And the reason for that is, to Mike's point earlier, the National Flood Insurance Program provides a maximum limit for a commercial building of $500,000. But if you have a major storm surge concern, if we can put that storm surge definition in the definition of wind or name storm, we've got the full value that we're insured for for that event. A lot of underwriters now in this market are carving out that definition of storm surge and putting it as water, which is essentially flood, which would be excluded by most property forms. And so now for storm surge scenarios, the insurance companies have taken that off their balance sheet through an exclusion. And any company that is severely concerned or has an exposure to storm surge has to go through the National Flood Insurance Program to get that first $500,000 limit and then go out to the excess flood marketplace to build capacity on top of that. Thank you, Jeremy. So what you've all been waiting for, catastrophe modeling, right? Very exciting. <laughs> We're going to go back to your days of statistics and confidence intervals and standard deviations. So this is where the heart rate really spikes. So um, cap modeling is, is widely subscribed to in the insurance industry. And really it's a, it's, a, it's a starting point for underwriters to get a better feel for how they're going to price your exposure. Um, for us as a broker, as a client advocate, um, what we've done is we've invested a lot in, in research and development over the last couple of years because RMS and AIR are the two um, widely subscribed modeling companies that insurance companies use to start that underwriting process. It is a, an extremely complicated algorithm, right? It's all based on weather, which you have University of Nebraska and other universities trying to predict how many named storms. They're typically always incorrect. Um, so how, how valid is that information? How, how much can we drill down to understand these complicated algorithms and formulas so that we can help our clients make a more informed decision as it relates to resiliency and constructability and how can we produce better modeling outcomes. So when an underwriter goes through this process, what, what, what they do is they rely strictly on the data that's provided by the broker. And it is a very slow bar for the amount of information that has to be submitted to that underwriter to actually get a quote. Um, what we do is for our property exposures, we, we drill as deep as we possibly can in the secondary construction characteristics. There are well over 100 variables that these models can model and produce outcomes on those cap models. Um, the basic information is construction, occupancy, protection, and exposures. But we go into the secondary construction characteristics to determine what additional information can we use to better influence the models to generate a better result for these underwriters. Because... The underwriters are using a number called the average annual loss 
to justify their premium against. The models produce an average annual loss. They multiply times their variable. There's your annualized property premium. So the better information that we can give within each one of those variables, it's going to have a larger rate credit on that average annual loss, the better the premium is going to be. So I'm going to talk about that in a, in a little bit on exactly what those secondary construction characteristics look like. Hazard modeling. So we look at frequency, severity, spatial distribution of cat events. Um, we, we raise up the confidence intervals by loss period, and then we determine the average annual loss. And ultimately, what is our most probable maximum loss for anywhere from 100 years to 10,000 years? We use that information to help our clients make informed decisions where you might have a large property portfolio, might be Florida only, might be spread throughout the U.S., but we can use that information to help you make a better decision as it relates to if you have a billion dollars around the U.S., you're not going to have one loss that destroys every single location. Or in the state of Florida, if you have $500 million in, in locations throughout the state, there's no one event that you're going to lose 100%. But what number in between zero and $500 million should you use as a loss limit for name storm so that you can reduce the amount of insurance that you're purchasing and save your costs and hopefully create some more competition in the marketplace? We go through an exposure analysis. We go through a vulnerability analysis, which speaks directly to resiliency, retrofitting, asset hardening efforts. Um, and then we go through a loss estimation and into a portfolio analysis. I think the next slide is going to give you a, a visual and a better understanding of what we try to get to. So this is a sample from RMS. So one of RMS and AR, the two widely subscribed modeling companies, um, they do a fantastic job. Underwriters subscribe to both. Typically, they produce both models. They compare the two, which tend to be pretty close to each other. Um, and that's how they, they predicate their underwriting and their pricing. So this is an example that I'm, I'm giving you today of, we'll call it a portfolio of half a billion dollars, um, locations throughout the state of Florida. So a nice spread of risk, but unfortunately it's all in coastal Florida. So what we look at here is we look at a return period, anywhere from 100 years at the bottom up to a 10,000 year return period at the top. That ties into a critical probability. So 1% chance of hitting the ground up loss for 100 year return period, which would be $10.3 million one time in a 100 year period versus a 0.01% chance or a 10,000 year return period for a $77 million ground up loss. Um, if you think about the lending environment today, um, historically, when the market was better, you could think about your homeowners, your personal auto insurance. If you don't have insurance produced and documented with the bank that you comply with the insurance requirements, they're going to force place it. They have a force place product that creates a lot of profitability for the bank as well, but it's going to cost you three or four times more. They're going to force place it to bring you back to compliance to the loan docs to make sure that they can document that. The banks and their force place products today are having the exact same issues that the rest of us are having. Their force place products are tapped out. There's no capacity left. So even the Fannies and Freddies of the world who tend to be very strict in those insurance requirements are having to come to the table to come up with a compromise. We leverage cap modeling to help them justify decisions that are unique to what they've done historically. So we go through this model. And if you think about a bank uh, for a homeowner's policy or a commercial property, they require flood insurance if you're outside of the, the X zone, right? The X zone is the safest zone, the 500 year floodplain. But if you're in a special hazard flood area, 500 year or below, they're going to force you to purchase flood insurance. So we use that same methodology for this. Flood insurance, 500 year, that's your threshold for insurance. Theoretically, we should apply the same notion, depending on the bank, depending on the situation, a lot of variables, but the same notion to name storm. 500 year for this client in particular, $35 million ground up loss. This client decided to buy more than that because they're conservative, but we use this to negotiate with the lenders to help them justify the decisions that we're making because there is, no, there is no ability to get $460 million in capacity in today's market. So there are no other options except for compromising to come up with a better strategy, a better widget so that we can come up with creative solutions to help meet the exception insurance requirements, but also help our clients have confidence that they're going to be protected in a large situation like this. So real quickly on this, this is the bare minimum of what it takes to get a property insurance quote. And I will tell you that many of our competitors, we have many great competitors. We have many great friends outside of Gallagher that do great work, but we have many competitors who provide the bare minimum to underwriters and it is not doing their clients any favors. If they're providing Joyce and Mason reconstruction with an office setting, 
here's where the fire hydrant is. Here's where the, the fire department is. Here's how many square feet we have sprinklered, yes or no. If that's the bare minimum that they're providing, you're missing a huge opportunity for improvement. We go through all those other variables, the secondary construction characteristics, so that we can model as favorably as we possibly can, because that's going to drive not only the price of, of the program, but it's also going to provide you with guidance as it relates to um, what are the terms and conditions going to be? Are there other underwriters who are going to step up to compete with those other markets based on the modeling itself? So the better data that we can provide up front to run through those models, the better the results are going to be and the more competition that's going to be stimulated. And you're going to be much happier with the result, I can assure you. Now, now, Jeremy, yes. let's talk about new construction. Yes. I know you're talking a lot about these secondary construction uh, components. Now, what are you know some of the higher weighted resiliency specs that you've seen have really had the best market outcome? Good question. So, um, so new builds, Heather, you know, we will we prefer to be at the table with developers and, and contractors as when they start the whole design conversation. So if they're working with design professionals, we want to give them guidance as it relates to what components, what secondary characteristics should they consider putting in the building? Because it might cost a little more in year one, but we'll run a net present value calculation. And over time, it pays for itself time and time again. Um, so I'll give you some examples. The roof is probably the, the largest component, as you could imagine, from a windstorm perspective that they, they want to look at. And there's a lot of different characteristics within a roof category that go into the model. So, you know, we have one client, for example, we, we figured out in that complicated algorithm for the models that if, if this client uses a, are there any contractors in the room? Yeah. All right. So correct me if I'm, if I'm off base here, if I say something wrong. Okay. Um, if they put a spiral shanked, hot dipped, galvanized nine inch steel nail in the roof, what a difference it makes in the model. We can run the same property through the model, but if we, if we recognize that we have a spiral shank, hot dip, galvanized steel nail that's nine inches long in the roof, the average annual loss is severely different for the better, for the better. You also have uh, requirements all above and beyond. Yes. Or minimums like uh, FM Global requirements. Absolutely. 100%. FM Global is one of the best risk, risk engineers, insurance companies out there, and their guidance is fantastic. We work closely with them on many of our clients to help make sure that we're investing in the right areas. It's going to get us the better, best outcome. It's a great example. Um, but some other more simple ones, you know, uh, roof geometry, for example. Um, if we have a, uh, a hipped roof, for example, it can have a 20% credit on the roof aspect of the overall average annual score. Um, anchorage, wraps, or, you know, single wraps, double wraps, um, anchorage systems, roof nails, um, wind tie systems, all those things make a, a real difference on the overall models. Um, opening protection, roof coverings, those are other, other large ones that can have a significant credit. Does, does elevation uh, play any role in getting credits? It does. It does. Um, more so on the, the flood side or even negotiating that storm surge definition to be included in the definition of name storm. Um, eleva elevation is a big deal, right? So the ability for us, if we have to go out, for example, Heather, and procure an excess flood policy, that elevation is going to be on the focal point of those underwriters in that excess flood market. How elevated is the structure and how much exposure do we have to normal rising water for flood, but also for storm surge? So last slide here. So the importance of resiliency and insurance. So we've covered a lot of this already, but if you think about being at the table with the design professionals, helping them understand the different material choices they have for a new structure or a retrofitted structure for that case, Heather, um, is so important. And spending a little bit more money in that um, can make a significant difference, especially in today's market. A lot of times these secondary characteristics are making the difference of whether or not uh, a company can actually get property insurance. And so, you know, if, if you think about the net present value, that's important, but being able to get access to insurance is perhaps even more important, right? So reduced risk of damage is a major component of resiliency. The stronger the building, it's not rocket science, the stronger the building, the lower the probability you're going to have of having a loss. It's going to create more competition for us. We're going to introduce a lot more underwriters if you have resiliency best practices incorporated into the structure itself. Um, and that's going to generate lower premiums, enhanced terms and conditions, um, and limit the amount of exclusions that we're seeing thrown into, into policies today. Um, theoretically, you should have a quicker recovery and a much lower business interruption loss. 
So the harder the building, the better it's designed, the better it's protected, the more resilient it is, the less likelihood that you're going to have a suspension of operations following a name storm or some other covered cause of loss. Uh, like, like 1450, like what we talked yeah. about when it opened, the competitive advantage, right? So much free marketing came from that, that design all over the country. You know, it was, it was amazing. It was a, it was a, it was a feat at, it, at its time. Um, free advertisement for the ownership of that building, right? Um, and it gives you a competitive advantage when you, when you invest in a building that gives the resilient aspect that it needs to have. Um, and then it gives you the community resilience. And as we talked about earlier, regulatory and incentive programs could be substantial as it relates to resilience as well. All right, so. Thank you, Jeremy. You're welcome. Uh, now, Amy. No, Heather, you're gonna oh, talk. Oh, no. oh, quickly, yeah. I just I did wanna kind of add to that, that if you're interested in incorporating kind of any resilient components into your project at the outset, there are already existing uh, exhibits that are created by the AIA recently in their latest rollouts in 2017, 2019, and 2020 for sustainable projects that are focused on doing this. So you can incorporate as part of your contract documents, and you can bring that to your broker like Jeremy, and you can show him, here are all the different things. Here is our sustainability <coughs> plan. Here are all of the resilient secondary characteristics that we are incorporating into our project. So you're getting those much better coverage terms right out of the gate. All right, thank you very much, Jeremy. All right now, Amy. Um, I will try to uplift us. Oh. <laughs> Put us down in a deep hole. So that's right. There's a way out of the hole. There's a way out of the hole. Yeah, yeah. There's a way out of the hole. You're right. It's building above the code, essentially. Yeah, but really, but thank you. I was taking a lot of notes, um, Jeremy. I appreciated that. And um, so it is a little bit depressing, but we got to learn those details, right? Um, yes. So I've had the, the pleasure of working directly with our risk manager um, over the years, because really what we're trying to do is to build resilience into not only our community, but our own city assets. And one of the things we've done is um, to do a presentation of our sustainability and resilience plans, our projects, and how we understand our risk and what we're doing to address it. And I, I'm happy to share that our insurance rates went up 8% this year, wow. where I think the average was around like 25% for, for at least for governments. So, um, you know, it worked and you know, we'll, we'll keep trying and at least what was in our own control. But um, it is, it's just interesting to see how this is all playing out and we're, we're, we're feeling it as well as an organization. Um, so a little bit about Miami Beach, and I'll start with that. Um, probably most of you know Miami Beach, uh, but uh, it's a, a very highly valuable community. And I like to say it's highly valuable, but also very highly vulnerable. Um, we have almost, we have $51.5 billion in taxable assessed values, the latest property tax rolls. Um, we are only seven square miles, um, completely built out. Um, over a hundred years old, so we do have aging infrastructure. Very, very densely built and populated. So Miami Beach is one of the only walkable communities in Florida. Um, and uh, as a matter of fact, our greenhouse gas emissions really aren't coming from vehicles, they're coming from buildings because uh, you know, we have a lot less driving. Um, we have extremely low elevation, close to sea level, um, a very porous limestone right underneath us for an av average of 4.5 feet in elevation. Um, and if you look at this cross section, we are highest on the, on the Atlantic Ocean side, on the beach and the dunes. And then we slope west towards the bay and some areas it's, you know, maybe 1.5 feet, two feet. Um, so definitely, you know, very, very um, high risk in terms of elevation. And 93% of our buildings and 97% of our actual land is in the FEMA special flood hazard area. So we have nowhere to go. You know, we can't really build somewhere else. Um, who wants to move us all to Miami, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, but just a little bit about, you know, Miami Beach and some of our own challenges. Um, I want to talk a little bit about resilience. Our definition is different um, than one that uh, Jeremy <clears throat> presented. Um, our uh, definition really focuses on this concept of um, understanding your risks, um, but building that capacity to survive, adapt, and grow no matter what happens. It looks at long-term stresses, as well as short-term shocks, shocks like hurricanes. Um, and this is a, a bit of a, a newer buzzword, I would say, in terms of um, the work that I do. 
now it's getting a little bit older. Um, but, you know, this concept of resilience, having a resilience officer connecting, you know, these dots is, is important. Um, but it also brings opportunities to evolve, in some cases, transform. Um, that's a, a, a picture of our Resilient 305 strategy, you know, that we adopted in 2019. It's not just for windstorm and, and major events, but it also addresses things like poverty, economic um, diversification. Um, you know, looking at other issues our, our city faces, um, you know, different infrastructure issues, um, and kind of like addressing those things that impact our city. Now, a resilient city, um, when it's hit by a shock or a stress, you know, such as a hurricane, when you are really have the capacity, um, the concept is that you're not just suffering and never coming back, but that you can even bounce back better, that it's an opportunity and that you're prepared um, ahead of time for that. Um, and when I'm often asked, you know, what's, what's, what's the plan? How are we planning for this? I, I often think it's a bit like world peace. You know, it's very hard to explain <laughs> how we're trying to address this existential threat for our city and South Florida, um, you know, much of our country and the world. It's, we're not alone in this. Um, but I like to break it down into a three-phased approach. One, utilizing the best available science and engineering that's constantly changing. Two, we have a lot of guiding plans and policies for both public infrastructure as well as private. And then three, implementation. You know, we are one of the only cities um, that is doing a lot of work in this area. There's a lot of studying going on, but we've had shovels in the ground. We have projects completed and we're doing all of this at once. Um, unfortunately, we're not allowed to go on a, a consecutive order in a real city, um, but as we do so, we are addressing certain, uh, utilizing certain guiding principles. And these were something that came out of an Urban Land Institute panel. We invited them to come to look at our island um, back in 2018 and to say, here's our approach and dissect it and, and give us some ideas. And they brought insurance people, they brought engineers, they brought an artist in residence, they brought planners, they brought um, an engineer from Denmark to really look at what we were doing. And they gave us these different principles, which we use to this day. Number one, to maintain urgency. We are very vulnerable, so we can't stop. Use incrementalism. So the first few projects we did were done very quickly. Um, there was elevation happening, new systems going in, done in a very quick way. Um, and those were for emergency areas. Now we've had the ability to look a little bit more comprehensively on how to best approach these projects. Ensure transparency. So the community has to be part of this throughout. Um, they need information. They need to know how it's gonna impact them. So we developed an entire neighborhood affairs division to make sure they surround these projects and to give a lot of information. And our website is fabulous. Respect the city's ecological endowment. I mean, we've got this game bay in our backyard. Our groundwater is connected to the tidal water. We have incredible natural resources. So everything we do, when we move water, we also have to treat the water and we have to make sure we're not creating pollution situations. Financially, pragmatism. I mean, all of this is extremely expensive. I don't have to tell you, um, but we have to be careful with what we invest and how. Recognize there are so many co-benefits. So as we're building, we are building our neighborhoods back more beautifully. We're adding better trees. We are doing wider <laughs> sidewalks. We're putting in bike lanes. We're doing all of those things that maybe nobody thought to do, you know, 100 or 50 years ago. Um, prioritizing social equity. So as we're approaching our projects, we are not only looking at flood risk, but we're looking at, um, you know, how many people live there. You know, where are the people more vulnerable? Where are the systems that are no, more vulnerable? And that it's not just based on someone's uh, zip code in terms of income, but, but a lot of other issues. Preserving our cultural identity. You know, we have 14 historic districts on Miami Beach and some of these properties are low, um, but they're beautiful and it's why people come to Miami Beach. So if all that disappeared, that would be a travesty. So how do we, how do we um, continue that over time? Finally, we know we're going to live with water. We're not going to be able to be high and dry um, that's just impractical. So how do we do that in a way that's as healthy as possible? And then having this longer term and regional perspective, um, and we're always working with others. Um, this is, you know, I'm not going to go through everything on here, but, you know, I just want to note that we are very aware of our South Florida risk. This is a um, sea level rise projection that was done for South Florida, and it was done by the Southeast Florida Climate Change Compact. And it's a regionalized projection that governments and you know, private industry can use to really plan out their infrastructure investments. And what we do as a city is look to time the investments with um, how important it is to, to protect them from flooding. So a park bench, we don't really care. It doesn't have to be built 10 feet off the ground. But you know, some of our facilities, it's very important that they're very high and protected. They're gonna be there for a very long time. So that's kind of how we time what we do. 
Um, these are adopted sea level rise projections um, from uh, the federal government for the most part. And um, you can see that that red line there, we're looking at 2070, um, you know, about 50 years from now, how do we make sure that our roads can stay higher than the tides until then? There are multiple curves because there's many variables. The further along that you go in the in the century, um, there's a lot of unknowns. But you know, we do have a lot of scientific <clears throat> certainty with the, what's happening closer. Um, so these are the curves we use, and then we actually plot out our infrastructure. These are our road elevation goals to make sure that that we are staying above that. Um, I mentioned projects, uh, plans, science and engineering. So we've adopted at least 15 different plans you know, over the last few years. Um, everything from a vulnerability assessment, and now we're doing an update. We have a new resilience code. Uh, we've got a stormwater master plan update. We have a seawall action plan. Um, you can kind of go down the list and see, but what I really love to point out is the picture there. You know, I took this um, every year we do, we hop on the police boat and we do a tour to see what's happening to our coastline with the high tides. And this is an older property right next to a newer property. And you see the difference in codes, the difference in elevation, both equally beautiful, but it's a city in transition. Um, and what are resilience projects? So this goes beyond normal city investments. Um, not only are we improving something, but we are uh, really adding in the protections. So road elevation, uh, bigger stormwater infrastructure to handle bigger storms, um, harmonizing the private property as we go about this and to also help private property adapt. Um, updating our water and sewer, because as we know, as floods come, water and sewer backups are a massive um, public health issue and a big problem. Again, the more walkable and bikeable and aesthetics. Our parks that have seawalls, we're doing everything we can to make them living shorelines so that they're improving the health of Biscayne Bay um, and, our, and our ecosystems. Um, and we've got our dune system and then a big reforestation project. This is um, our dune system. And I wanted to start with this because this is the biggest line of defense on Miami Beach. This is seven miles of protection. It is um, you know, green infrastructure. It's also mo a mobility corridor that's fully connected along the east side of Miami Beach. People use this to go to work now and bike. And we have more walkers and bikers than we need, quite frankly, um, causing some conflict. But the dune is um, very high now. Uh, it is about 10 feet on average. And um, when you get down to South Point, uh, we have points that are at 18 feet. So, which is really, really incredible when you think about how much it's grown over time. Mm -hmm. um, and the beach looks very wide and beautiful. Uh, we just had a $40 million re-nourishment. But you know, I love this picture because it shows what we can do. And then this is what the beach looked like <coughs> uh, in the 1970s. So it's pretty amazing to see how much we have done to add projections, even though we face this risk. And I. I find this to be like kind of inspiring and in what we can do. Mm -hmm. In terms of some of the neighborhoods, we're also, you know, dealing with just, just any normal city. Um, how do we adapt these roads? And, and we have completed four different areas, Sunset Harbor, Palm and Hibiscus Islands, Indian Creek Drive, West Avenue Phase 1, and we have three different projects in the hopper in different phases. Um, and this, if you look very closely, this is an example of harmonization where the road was elevated and you can see that retaining wall in the middle of the top picture. And you can kind of see where the road and the sidewalk were elevated up and that retaining wall kind of disappears. So this is an example of an actual project um, where we've had, where we've done this elevation. Amy, yes. I have a question. I, sure. I think you were telling me that at least one of these projects that you had completed, you did a <coughs> analysis or a survey about the increase in property values mm -hmm. or the return from this project alone. Yes, I'm gonna show that, I'm gonna okay. that. It's coming. <laughs> um, and this is one of those projects. And what's fascinating here, whenever you see these flooding pictures, those are, those are sunny day flooding. Um, this is Sunset Harbor and uh, same sort of tidal elevation, but you can see there was significant flooding in 2012, no flooding in, in, in uh, 2019 with the same tidal elevation. Um, we have to elevate because the, the ground water is right underneath us and it's tidally in, influenced and you cannot pump that away in the same way you would rainwater. Here's just another picture of Sunset Harbor, um, you know, a before and after. Um, and this I actually took on my first day on the job. <laughs> this was already in process. This is Sunset Harbor and you can see here 
a dramatic change between the old road and the new road. This was really one of the lowest areas in the city. This was raised to two and a half feet. The rest of the city won't need to be elevated this much. Um, but it is you know, important to note that about half our roads don't meet the requirements that we need to that are highlighted in those projections. I think we have a question. Yeah. Sure. Um, did you build elevations of the roads or did you build the infrastructure and the need for better filtration, better water? Um, Both, yeah. So the, the, the roads are elevated in uh -huh. order to keep cars out of the water. But when we do that, we do need space to add in large stormwater systems. So we're going from a 10-year storm event, five-year storm to a 10-year storm event. And that requires a lot of room. Uh, the pipes are massive. We're also putting in new water and sewer at the same time and other utilities. And we're a very dense, small community. So we also need the space. But the, the reason is, is to basically for the tides. Mm -hmm. Was this, may I ask a second sure. follow-up mm -hmm. question here? Was this because of the fact that um, the excessive amount of rain that we're getting, or is it because we see a little bit of a sea elevation? What's that, so, I mean, what you're referring to is compound flooding. And when you have multiple times of, types of events, it's obviously much worse than if sure. you just had one. But primarily, it is the high tides. It's yeah. just the regular regular level of the ocean that has increased dramatically. You know, we've seen a foot of sea level rise over the last century uh, in Southeast Florida, and that's based on the Key West tidal curves. You know, we're seeing, we're gonna see probably another one to two feet within the next 30 to 40 years. So it's accelerated pretty dramatically. Um, this is kind of the, the grand plan. Um, this is how uh, we worked with a, an engineering firm to look at all of our neighborhoods and our, and our watersheds and to say, you know, how should we organize this? Um, as you can imagine, if you've got a project coming down your neighborhood, you want to know why and when. And um, some people want the project, some people don't want the projects, and it's, um, it's, it's controversial. I mean, construction is very difficult. So this is the plan that we have approved by our city commission. And then each project is individually approved and funded um, through our capital budget process. What's the funding? Can you take us a little bit on Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's different. Yeah, so we have an invested over 200 million already um, as a city, and we used that through raising stormwater rates. We used it, we had money through um, uh, some grants um, primarily, but that's kind of looking forward primarily from uh, funding from a, a CRA that we had uh, that was changed to specifically. Um, focus on, on stormwater, and so different different ways. And then going forward, we've gotten, I think about 60 million in grant funding, but we will need to raise rates. I mean, this is not something that um, can be done fully by grants, it's a combination. You know, I mentioned parks, and if, if any of you had, had had the chance to go to Brittany Bay Park um, in Miami Beach, this park, uh, we took the opportunity to, instead of just having a seawall along Indian Creek, we pulled the seawall into the park and you sort of see that long sidewalk looking thing um, near the water. Um, we created a lookout for people to be able to access the water and to see it. But then we built sort of this bioswale that's floodable so that people can um, have connection with the water, that it can flood as the tides come in. And there's also kind of a seat with that seawall. And this is kind of a theme for how we're doing this work on Miami Beach. People still want access to the water. We don't want to build a fortress and nobody wants to just live, see, you know, look at a seawall. Um, it's a beautiful project. I you to visit Brittany Bay. Mm -hmm. um, this is another interesting project. Um, I'm sure when you come over the MacArthur and come into <clears> Miami <throat> Beach and going on to Alton, you know, there's just this big ugliness that has been there for a very, very long time. And this is a great example of a negotiation between private developer and the city to exchange height and development for a park, a public park, a three acre park that had a lot of resilience elements. So it's really kind of a great example of that. Um, you can see what it used to look like on the left. Um, in the middle is a construction picture that I took um, where there's, you see this big bioswale that goes around the park. Um, and all the way on the right, you see sort of what it looks like now, which is very beautiful. Um, and this is what it looks like from an aerial view. This park is elevated. It has so many resilience features. Um, it basically retains most of its stormwater. It has a 25,000 gallon underground cistern that's used to water all of the vegetation. Um, it has uh, about 40 different plant and tree species, 80% are native. 
and it's really for us a, a jewel and um, the flooding in that area has decreased substantially. And then the other exciting thing is as part of this deal um, is a geo bond general obligation funded project that will be a pedestrian walkover bridge at the, at the mouth of the MacArthur as you enter into Miami Beach so that people can get from that park um, and that new community that's being built to the south part of Fifth Street. So um, it's gonna be quite beautiful and we're pretty excited. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the business case because I, I did hear that um, you know, <clears throat> talked about a little bit. And you know we also want to understand, is it worth it to invest? And people wanna know as you're coming down my street, are you gonna hurt my property values or are you gonna help my property values? So we did a very robust um, project. Uh, we used AIR for the cap modeling. We did uh, uh, complex stormwater modeling. We uh, did hedonic modeling to understand the impact on property values to say, with this project, you know, how might um, all of this work in terms of stormwater improvements impact Miami Beach? Um, no surprise, you know, the pilot study showed that the benefits are important um, and they significantly outweigh their costs and benefits. Um, and I'll show you some of the results. This could be a presentation in and of itself. And one of the things we learned is that the parcel elevation and the road elevation positively impact property values. Um, there was about 15 years of data collected um, to determine this, and this was also um, peer reviewed, um, and that home prices are higher for parcels at higher elevation. And, um, and when the initial, when you have a, a kind of a real low area and that area is elevated, uh, there's more appreciation value. And when this was applied to Sunset Harbor, the first neighborhood that we did, um, there's about a $41 million increase just because of the elevation piece of it. And again, this is taken into account all of that modeling. And actually that, that neighborhood is thriving. I'd be interested to know what that number is now. Um, and we know that at least 2 billion of road elevation and stormwater protection is worth it for Miami Beach over the next 30 years. Um, and they, they feel that number is actually pretty, pretty um, conservative. Um, but I want to shift a little bit to private property. You know, I, I personally took these pictures um, on that police boat. We're doing so much for our public infrastructure, but the private property piece is also very important. Um, you know, Miami Beach has areas that are, you know, much poorer, much older, like a lot of cities, we're not all Ritz and Glam. And this, this is in North Beach, um, and clearly a lot of work needs to be done here. And we started um, a new program, the Private Property Adaptation Program. We have 42 people in it. Um, it's a competitive program, 50-50 matching grant, but we'll, we will provide up to $20,000. Um, to residents or businesses um, to, to participate. And what you get for this is an assessment. So we work to develop a flood risk assessment with three options um, for the property. And then the homeowner or property owner decides which one they wanna go with. They hire their um, consultant or their contractor and enter into an agreement with us and then we will reimburse them. So we're super excited about this as you know, something that um, and we started a few years ago and now it's really off the ground and running and we've gotten over three million dollars from our city commission to, to move this forward and this is just from last week we had a big kickoff event and now i'm going to turn it over to maria to give you some <laughs> great examples oh, <clears throat> oh the how would you prepare you, or that might stand you know, the maria's going to do a lot of shoes house yeah <laughs> the button but I'm going to take some notes. Oh, how many of you have been to the convention center, the Miami Beach Convention Center? Oh. Um, how many of you remember it back in the day before we did the renovation, when it was pink and blue and we had all those colors? Totally different now as everybody. You know. So um, I was the project director of that project. Um, the former city manager appointed me. Uh, to do and run this project once we got all the bonds. So it's a $640 million project. Um, and it is in <coughs> the middle of Miami Beach, as everybody knows. It's a 25 acre parcel. The building itself is on 16 acres of land. It was a $575 million construction contract uh, with Clark Construction. Um, and uh, we started the project back in 2014, nine years ago. And all the decisions that we had to make at the time, we had to consider um, for the circumstances that we had. And the biggest circumstance that we had was that we had to keep the building open. So how many of you have been to Art Basel? 
tents. So for those of you that have been to our Basel, you know what a big fair that is. Um, the deal was that our Basel had to come into the building every year. There was no way that we could relocate to another city at any time um, uh, because it would mean rebranding your entire show. You all know how important that show is to the county, what it's done to this whole area, what it's become. So we had to, um, we had to organize the construction of the building around that show and in the same time keep the building open 50 percent of the 50 percent of the building open for other shows emerge we had um major league baseball fan fest uh the auto show the jewelry show all those events that many of you have been to that are the, the super bowl <laughs> um uh that all of you have been um, going to for many years um, they had to remain in the building while we were building this whole project all around it so um, a lot of the decisions we made uh, were pretty, were pretty um, forward-thinking back in the day. Today, we talk about resilience and sustainability. Nine years ago, nobody would really talk about those concepts, but um, we had a great design team, and being part of Miami Beach, we knew what we had to do. Uh, we couldn't go as far as we wanted because the building had to remain open. It wasn't like we could tear down the entire thing and raise it up five or six feet. That was not possible. We had to um, raise floors while the shows were happening. Um, so we did all of that. Um, the biggest change, obviously, to the entire uh, location is what we did here. This is six acres of what used to be um, not only a parking lot, but really um, a staging area for trucks. As you can see, there's not a single tree in the entire property. Um, it was a six acre heat, heat island in the middle of Miami Beach. It's hard to um, even believe today that that actually exists. This is our Holocaust, just for context, this is our Holocaust Memorial, uh, which is undergoing a big uh, expansion today. It's also getting new lawn funds for that. So is our botanical garden. We're putting money into that through our new general obligation bond that got approved last year by the voters. Uh, this is City Hall in our garage. That is the Jackie Gleason Theater. And this right here is the, um, the lot where the future uh, convention center hotel is gonna go. And of course the building doesn't do look anything like that anymore. Um, and uh, up in that corner, we have our Carl Fisher Clubhouse. It's uh, also part of the renovation that we did. It's the oldest uh, public structure in Miami. So uh, right off the bat, this was our vision. And our vision was that we were going to make this a green space. Then this park uh, is today. It's called Pride Park. Um, but it also had to act as a um, an event space for Design Miami. Um, any of you that have gone to Art Basel have seen the Miami, uh, the Design Miami tent in front of the building. So we're gonna, I'm going to show um, a, a lot of quick before and after slides of how that looked and what it looks like today. Um, then we went into an entire renovation of um, 21st, this 21st Street Park along the Collins Canal. The other big thing that we did in the building is that we removed all the parking and put it on the roof. In order for us to do that, we had to tear down this entire section of the building from the ground and rebuild it up so the structure could hold those cars. And um, we also enclosed a loading dock in the north side of the building so you'd never see those trucks again and we put uh, parking on the roof. We have about 30 uh, spaces today for electric vehicles, and you get to those spaces through Helix. So all of that is sort of swallowed by the skin of the building, which is really the most impactful thing that we did. Uh, basically, the building is not a big glass box, but if you see those um, iconic fins that we put on, that's really what makes the building uh, pretty special from, uh, from the street. The building is only a silver lead certification. That's what it was at the time uh, required in the city. Today, gold is our standard. Uh, but again, this project started in 14. We spent two years designing it. <coughs> we went into construction in 2016, and we got substantial completion in April 2020. Um, it has many uh, resilient features, and um, you know we planted many trees. I'll show you all some photographs. These are the things that we did the most of. We raised uh, this park to an elevation of seven. I, it was at, uh, I believe it was three when we started, when that parking lot was there. We also raised all the roads 
around um, that park. And um, at the same time that we also, the, the other big thing that we did in the building, because um, we had to keep it open, we couldn't raise the entire building, is that we raised all the critical systems of the building up to a level of 23. So you could basically have an entire storm surge over the building, um, and you would still have your, crit your critical systems, your communication systems, generators, all your electrical switch gear, all the stuff that would keep the building open after the fact is all at high levels. So we were able to, we have three volts, uh, Florida power light bolts, all of that is up at the second level. So that's how we were able to mitigate the fact that we couldn't just raise the entire building itself. Uh, oh, um, we also have two huge stormwater pump stations in two different locations. Those, th those pump stations take um, stormwater from adjacent neighborhoods. These are the largest ones we have in Miami Beach. They're like 25,000. <laughs> They're big, um, and they take a lot of stormwater, um, pumping pumping it through vortex systems to clean it through to the canals. Um, so we did that there. This is the park itself. It's um, black and white, so you can really see the red. So we raised everything, like I said, um, and then we created this flexible lawn. We increased the permeable area through this project by about two hundred um, and forty five. Nothing but concrete and asphalt, and now it's mostly. So this is how uh, this is one thing that we did. The existing asphalt parking area that I showed you was down here, um, and our final grade is about three feet taller. We planted hundreds of trees um, in the project, and by doing this, you keep the trees out of where you have not only um, your uh, water table but also contaminants. Uh, this, this was a former golf course. There was a lot of contamination on the site that had to be mitigated. So this is what it looked like when it was under construction. Those are the fins. The actual building itself and all the roads around it had already been raised and finished. And then we took on uh, the actual park because this was the staging area for construction or uh, where the park. So this is what it looks like today. This is an aerial view. Of course, you can tell the difference that first picture that I showed you of um, this in this chain. This is what it looks like today on the rooftop of our garage. This is from the building itself. That grass is actually real. It looks fake. <laughs> but it's really beautiful. Um, we keep it very, very well trimmed because all the events that come, they look always. And this is a, a sculpture that we just received. Compliments of Mr. Marlon Brandon gave that to the city. Um, this is a uh, convention center drive in front of the building before. So I used to always say that you can land a little airplane here because there was not a single tree other than these palms <laughs> in the entire place. Of course, that was the old parking lot, and that's what it looks like today. So I took this picture myself a few days ago. Uh, we planted all these uh, limo trees, and they're doing very well. There's uh, Nina. Um, this is the view from across the street on Meridian, the old building. Today, you can't even see the building. Or if you're walking or you're biking, all those trees are there. This was the former entrance. This is today's entrance. Again, we planted a whole bunch of trees. Um, now, to go to the back of the, this is like my favorite area of the whole project. So, um, this area, uh, this canal area, um, had a lot of challenges. And the area was like, it was really ugly. <laughs> So this is the previous north side of the building that had an open um, uh, freight uh, loading dock with parking. So you, again, you can see all of the asphalt and then the crawl bridge of house was completely dilapidated, was um, in the corner. So what we did, the first thing that we had to think about, we thought about this nine years ago, is the things that we actually consider assets. We had a hundred, we have a hundred year van entry um, of course, our canal, um, the existing mahogany trees that we had back there, and our Carl Fisher Clubhouse, these are, these are assets to the city, and we wanted to make sure that we protected and enhanced all of them. Um, so uh, what we did is, first of all, we added, we removed 1.8 acres of all that 
um, asphalt that was in this area below, um, then we enclosed that loading dock, never to be seen again unless you're in it. Um, and we put the parking on the roof. And then that created a wall and an opportunity to have, you know, kind of like a different sort of seawall in this area. So we created another 3.5 acres of open space, we renovated the edge of the canal, and we preserved a bunch of those mahogany trees. So these are the quick sketches that I'm going to go through. But nine years ago, this is what we were thinking. Um, we said, okay, this is our existing condition back there. We have this little, like, dilapidated um, heat wall that was broken down, and in some areas it was okay, and in other areas it was non existent. But it has sort of charm, you know, um, and it also had a lot of vegetation right up against it, a lot of beautiful trees. And then it had this walkway, and then it had a fence and more trees. So we said, okay, what can we do here? If we were to do a hard edge, a seawall, which is what everybody sees all over the place, you plant a seawall at six feet, which is where it needed to be, first thing that would happen is all those beautiful trees would be gone. We'd have to get rid of those. Um, so we said, you know, we don't want to do that. Um, and then we have to go through all this Army Corps permitting, and we said, maybe we don't want to do that either. So we said, okay, what do we really need here? This is the wall of our building now, which is that skin of that uh, loading dock. And we need to have a seawall right about in that location. Uh, it's really to protect a building. So what we did is what we call a soft edge. So we decided to plant mangroves, preserve the seawall the way it was. And then we created this sort of, um, it was like a floodable, we had to stabilize and we created this floodable edge. And what it created, it just left a lot of the natural landscape. And it, by keeping the landscape, we brought the actual real seawall, new seawall, up against the building. Of course, it had to be beautiful. It would be a little seawall. So this is the design and how it ended up. So we have our mangrove edge, uh, we have a walkway, we have what we call our living shoreline. So <clears throat> we left those trees the way they were, and then we put a secondary seawall over here on this side. There's our building, and we made that seawall a bench. So this is a terrible slide because it's very green. But this is what it looks like today. And this is what was. That's when we walked back there, which was nowhere anybody wanted to be. Um, this was the vision that we had. And we re-envisioned what this was going to be with our designers. Estate was our landscape firm, and this is what we had. So we had a very robust on the um, art and public places program. Seven and a half million art um, was put into the project inside and outside the building, and oh, there's our seawall. So this is the real seawall that's protecting the building. This is another view going in the opposite direction, actually, towards the Pearl Fisher Clubhouse. That's it. Beautiful back there. And now it's like a gem in Miami Beach. Nobody ever knew this was here. Now everybody knows it's here. We, um, we ask, you know, we take a lot of people back there. So Carl, Carl Fisher Clubhouse, old little building. It was the original clubhouse here um, when this was a golf course, and it was a gigantic golf course back in the day. Um, and this was our rendering to restore it, and we did that. So we invested uh, three and a half million dollars into this project. This is also part of it. It's actually a, uh, a public space now. If you all ever want to go to Rome Room, it opened a couple of months ago. <laughs> Um, and we have Samantha Cruz, she's a celebrity chef, she's our chef there, and it's open, so you, you all can go and um, happy hour, whatever. <laughs> and it's beautifully done inside, beautiful. And this building is now um, a space that can be used for meetings or private events, and it's tucked away in the back of the property there, um, stored by um, a historic architect, it, that part of the project. Okay, so this is something 
kind of different now. Um, when we talk about assets and what we consider to be something important, um, trees are it because in my speech it's very hard to, to really have them because we have so much pavement. This is the site of our future hotel. And these are two, uh, they're called Brazilian beauty leaves. Uh, they're also called califylum trees, 60 years old. Um, and they were right up against the edge of the piece of the, of the, of a building that was on the campus of the Jackie Kinsey Theater. So uh, Tara, uh, who's our developer and the joint venture with the Sofers, um, are the developers of the site. And I asked David Martin myself <laughs> for him not to take down these trees. Um, they could have mitigated this through a fund and paid into a fund. But you can't replace those trees in a fund. So I told them, you gotta be okay. Right? You can't put a chainsaw to the tree. This is all. You just can't. So he hired the best guy ever to do this. Oh, um, Walter McCree from, um, from Green Integrities, or Deerfield, Deerfield Beach. I was here the whole time. This was <clears> done. <throat> These things got put on this truck and got transferred. We had to take down overhead lights and everything to make this happen. Um, but it was an amazing to watch. And a crane put these two gigantic trees um, on the corner of the park in front of the convention center, right in front of the Holocaust Memorial. So if you all ever go to the Holocaust Memorial, there's any of the fun, you will see those, these two trees right in the corner. And you will know <laughs> that these are the ones I showed you because they were not part of the original design of the park. These came later, and today it's one year that they have been planted, and they're doing beautifully. So it was a huge risk, a biggest expense, but this is an example of government and a developer coming together, um, and they care about it just like we do. So uh, when that happens, that synergy happens, great things happen. So um, these are there now, and this is when they're you know they're lowered by the crane. The pits for them are ready to go. And this is when they were put down that same day. They still have all the struts on them. So now, and they're all manicured and fabulous. How much did they weigh? 70 tons each. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just have a couple of quick projects to show you. I'm also the director of the Giovanni program for the city. There are two programs, one in 2018, uh, which has 57 projects um, that are parks, uh, infrastructure, public safety projects. And now we have a new um, a new geobomb that is going to focus on uh, for about 21 other projects. But this is one of the um, one of the most notable projects in the original bond. This is 20 acres of land in the Bayshore Park neighborhood. <clears throat> um, and it was a uh, a park free golf course. It sat for years without being used. And now what it's going to do is, is something pretty special. We're building a lake, a two acre lake, in the middle of the project, it's a $42 million project. And that lake has been designed to partially um, control the watershed from, this in, in, from these adjacent neighborhoods. So the piping of those neighborhoods is gonna go into this two acre, let's call it a retention pond, and it naturally percolates down into the ground, and that's gonna uh, reduce the amount of infrastructure that we actually need. It took Durham two years to accept this concept. Um, and we had to keep working with them and working with them and doing more calculations and proving to the, them that this works and it wasn't going to contaminate the neighborhood because all golf courses are contaminated, all of them because of the fertilizer that gets used. Um, so we had to convince Durham that this was the way to go and they accepted it. And we are breaking ground on this, our groundbreaking by <coughs> 30 in the afternoon. So <laughs> it's happening starting on Tuesday. This is what it's gonna look like. This is a render. It's a beautiful passive park with pavilions and all kinds of wonderful things. And of course, you this retention pump, which is uh, acting as a drainage system. Finally, uh, this is the last project I'll show you. We have a fire station that we're going to do south. And it's on a half acre site, large site for 
Miami Beach in this location. And because we had this space, uh, we were able to do some special things as well. The biggest thing being uh, the first floor is 10 feet above the street. This is a very low part of Miami Beach. And this is a Cat 5 building. So, um, so you can see how the trucks, which need a long distance to be able to ramp up the car, um, have to have this distance in order to be able to go into the building. The building's in the center, and then the rest of the site are these big ramps. Parking for the firefighters is underneath, so we've raised up the entire building, um, and it's you know, it's pretty high in the neighborhood. Eventually, all the streets in that area will have to be not as high, but you know, at least two feet higher. And that's it. I think the plan now is just um, to talk about the future and what we see, like some of the, the next big things happening. And um, just to talk a little bit more about a couple plans is we have a study adopted called Buoyant City, which introduces how to adapt our historic districts. And they are recommending two things. One, to adapt in place and two, to elevate certain entire neighborhoods. So a lot of those design guidelines are in this document. Um, it was done by a very renowned um, architect, his name escapes me right now, Ellen Shulman, yes. and, uh, um, and, and a team to really see what are we gonna do about these buildings. So a lot of what our planning team has done is to take these guidelines and make them uh, be able to be implemented within a, within a resilience code. Um, this is a picture of an existing building and I work every year with an FIU uh, graduate class to take our different plans on Miami Beach and make them come alive with existing buildings. So this particular student took this courtyard based building and um, he reimagined it like this, where he actually, you know, created a, a patio walkway <coughs> around the second floor. The first floor he imagined to be um, uh, mangroves. Uh, who knows if that first floor was actually abandoned because that can happen over time. But maybe one of the things that happens into the future um, this was a vision of 2070, so they were looking at a couple feet of sea level rise. Um, behind the building, they added on another layer, which is a concept from Europe that we plan to really see happening here in South Florida, where it's your building um, not getting rid of the old, but adding on new um, adjacent to it and repurposing those existing buildings. We also have a resilience code that was just adopted to address adaptation and resilience. Um, to modernize and simplify our code, because all this is very confusing for anybody trying to do work, um, and to really have historic preservation and flexibility over time. And this code was adopted earlier this year, and one of the things it needed to do was to really make sure people understand how to transition private property into the public property, and um, understanding the crown of road may be different um, over time. And so can you imagine trying to, to figure that out? It's very, it's very difficult, but so we are carefully requiring different um, transitions. And we also adopted within the element different um, higher floor to ceiling heights so that buildings can be adapted over time, that interior floor can come up. Um, we have rules for understories. So the buildings have to be so high now um, that there's rather than being on stilts like the keys, it's more like an understory where you can park your car and sort of use the space, not live in it. Um, it really, uh, we have green building standards for sustainability in there. We have higher seawall heights that are required. Um, our minimum freeboard across the city um, is higher than what's required by FEMA. And we do encourage people to, and allow people to, to build much higher. This is a picture of our floodplain manager. Um, this is, so this is the future. You know, this is what's required now in terms of elevation. This particular building, I think is 13 feet NAVD. So it is higher than required, but that living room starts kind of where his hand is. I'm just showing you the, the, the change. Um, we do a lot of innovative type work. We have a project right now with University of Miami that we participate in where they're testing out different sorts of offshore protection for Miami Beach. And they're testing a combination of green and gray infrastructure and particularly resilient corals that can handle warmer waters, that can handle wave action. And um, we just kicked this off this year. It's been in study for years and UM actually has a wave tank where they're testing all of these corals. Again, it's just a pilot, but could have you know, huge ramifications for the future. 
Um, there's also a study underway with the core uh, where they're looking at sea level rise and storm surge, um, you know, 50 years from now and, and really how to plan for that across Miami-Dade County. Some of the things they're thinking about, um, really, really out of the box ideas, you know, how to have more mangroves, more living shorelines, how to use green infrastructure. For Miami Beach, that may include elevating the dune system more, putting the beach walk on top of the dune system, um, potentially storm <coughs> surge gates at the base of the government cut and haulover. So really a lot of out of the box ideas happening. It's very much in the feasibility stage now. Um, and then just, they have two main approaches, you know, one elevating and adapting with nature. So letting the water come in and really having a lot of elevation of structural, um, you know, homes and critical assets or two, this barrier defense system. Again, like how do we build up in the face of storm surge? So these are ongoing right now. You may have seen them in the news. Uh, this summer was a go or no go between the County and the Army Corps and it's a go. So they're gonna continue to study and the project uh, the study will be done in 2027. Um, then I always love to end with a slide. I mean, we are very proud that we try to tell our story and uh, we were issuing um, bonds for, um, I think the geo bond last mm -hmm. uh, 2019. And we did get a nice report from SNP um, just reviewing all of our work and stating that we do have among the most robust plans that they've seen trying to address um, climate change risks that they've seen for local government. So we do know the more that we can keep our ratings high, it allows <coughs> us to be able to invest to in turn to protect our community. So that's all we have. We've been Thank talking you. a very long time. Thank you. <laughs> um, any questions? Yes. Patricia. So for Amy or, or for anyone there, all those precious little hotels on South Beach, mm -hmm. one of which you showed a picture of, are you saying you're going to lift those hotels up or are you saying that the ground floor is going to get wet mm -hmm. and you're going to just live on the second floor? Mm -hmm. What is it that you're talking about doing? Sure. Aside from building all of the Right. So, I mean, we as a city wouldn't do it. It would be that property owner. Yes. What, we're, what we're trying to do is enable as many options as possible for people to adapt their buildings over time. Um, so there's a lot of different options depending on the characteristics of the building. One, um, they could adapt in place. They could um, basically keep the shell of the building and lift the interior of the building. And that has been done on Miami Beach at the Browns Hotel mm -hmm. um, so that it is more protective, but you are you know, sort of preserving the historical structure and the nature of the building. Um, the entire building itself could be elevated if it's structurally possible. Um, we could abandon the first um, floor in, in South Florida. That could be the future if we're talking, you know, the next, as we as move on in the decades, as the water gets higher. But you have to strengthen that floor then if you're going to, if it's coming down the water. I mean, there would be a lot of, you know, considerations that have to be made yeah. in that case. Um, and, and, but yeah, that is part of it. And, and so it's hard to, it's crazy to, to envision, um, but that, that is an alternative rather than just, you know, removing it and, and rebuilding or not. Um, one, one project that is coming down the pipeline that I thought was really interesting that we talked about was the North Beach Town Center mm -hmm. and how that really also is kind of an example of the, the yeah. public and private sector coming together. Yeah, that's a great example. So we have, um, when you take the 79th Street Causeway into Miami Beach, um, and you get out to Miami Beach proper, um, we call that the sort of the North Beach Town Center. There was a master plan done that basically gave the ability for more height um, for developers. And I think there's, I wanna say 12 or 13 um, different parcels that have been passed through our planning boards for redevelopment and they're all in different phases. And so they're able to build higher, so add more density. In return, they have to build more resiliently. So the base, it has to be base flood plus five, the first finished floor. There are wider sidewalks. They have to put in bigger trees with the, the underground infrastructure so that the roots will thrive. Um, in areas where there aren't trees, they have to provide shade, you know, because of the heat that we face here. Um, and it's a, it's a bit of a, was a negotiation and a, and a trade-off to really spur development, but also doing it in a way that is more resilient. So as a city, we went and got about $10 million from the state to design the public infrastructure. So that design um, is just kicking off with the intent that it's a fully funded 
we call them neighborhood improvement projects where you've got the stormwater, the water and sewer, the road elevation and, and all of that. And it's an, an area that is very dense, it's commercial, <coughs> and um, you know, we're, we're pretty excited about that. We're very excited. All right, I just wanna lead a little round of applause for all of our speakers. Really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. I, I hope for everyone uh, that has attended, it's a little bit different. I think some of the things you've heard before, and and that's what we're trying to do is uh, is give you a little more insight into how some of these concepts actually are playing out in the real world. And and uh, we're so fortunate to have uh, the folks from the city of Miami Beach to really talk about. You know, this is one of the few communities where resilience is really part of the fabric of the city now, and it's being implemented every day. And we want to give thanks to our speaker on insurance. You know, it's 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 important to understand, as Jeremy said, you know, there are changes in the the fundamental ways that insurance is actually funded in the real world, right? Not what we think about when we go out to get a policy that are having impacts in our day-to-day -day life that I certainly wasn't aware of. So I want to thank Jeremy very much for bringing that to our attention. And now the important part, the most important part is the social part where we're finally post COVID and all these things and we can enjoy a few cocktails and have a chance to meet and hopefully uh, answer any questions you may have. So thank everyone so much for being here. Thank you.